did you all notice this amazing thing I just did? And I bet that actually most of you might have done the same thing before you just sat down. And I'm, of course, talking about walking. What I'm doing right now, standing, balancing. It's something that feels so natural and therefore so easy to most of us. But when you look at it in detail, you see that it's actually quite amazing. Because it involves all these different sources of information. Information from what your eyes perceive, information from your inner ear, from your joints, from the muscles in your leg, and then dedicated circuitry in your spine and your brain has to integrate all this information very quickly and then decide which muscles to activate at what time and in what way to make sure that you can walk to the fridge or that I, like in this case, can walk onto the stage without falling over. But we've not always been good at this. It takes a lot of time to master this very difficult skill. As a child, it took you years to learn how to stand up, walk, and balance. But when you can finally do so, you can do all these versatile, very amazing things. We can run, we can trot, we can jump. And when we trip, we can recover quite well. And the same counts for if a bully pushes you, or you're hit by a gust of wind. And this makes our walking quite robust, as we call it. And if I look at your and my walking, we see that it's actually very similar. And that's because we have similar bodies. And walking is evolution strategy for this very simple problem. Getting your body from A to B in a somewhat energy efficient way without getting hurt. But now imagine that you cannot walk anymore. So this is Nick. He has lost almost all his leg function due to medical trauma making him a spinal cord injury patient. He cannot feel his legs anymore. He can activate his upper legs a little, but he can definitely not stand and walk anymore. And because of that, he has to spend most of his days inside a wheelchair. And although he can live a very fulfilling life when being in a, a fulfilling life when being in a wheelchair, always sitting down can lead to several problems. For example, not using your bones and muscles will make them atrophy. They become smaller and weaker. And when your, bones, when your muscles become smaller, they get closer to the skin. And when you sit down, you get more pressure points and therefore pressure sores or pressure ulcers. When you don't use the joints in your leg, they can lock and you can damage them when you actually move your legs later. And when you're always sitting down, there's a possibility that you develop also bowel issues. And being in a wheelchair might make you more dependent on others. Infrastructure around us is still not ideal for wheelchair users, unfortunately. And because you're closer to the ground, you might need help from others to get something for you. For example, from a top shelf. And during social interactions, you're never really at eye level with your conversational partner, which could lead to issues with self-esteem. But Nick, he's not alone in this. There are many people who cannot walk anymore due to some kind of injury. And they all have their own specific set of problems. And therefore, my colleagues and I at the Wearable Robotics Laboratory at the University of Twente want to help people like Nick. We want to develop the ideal assistive device that can get them out of the wheelchair, to get them to stand, balance, and walk again. And our solution to this problem is the powered robotic exoskeleton. And an exoskeleton is a robot that you wear around your body. The motors in the exoskeleton, they can help you in moving your joints, and the total support structure makes sure that everything stays in place, that it can apply forces onto your body, and also apply forces to the floor. And this powered robotic exoskeleton might sound futuristic, but it really is not. As you can see here in this satirical drawing from around the 1830s, 
where the artist drew a steam-powered exoskeleton for the rich. In the same image, he also drew steam-powered wheeled vehicles and steam-powered flying vehicles, which would become the cars and airplanes that did become reality several decades later. He also realized very well that if your exoskeleton runs out of steam, you need a servant to get you going again. But in reality, one of the first exoskeletons was developed by General Electric. It was called the Hardiman, and it was developed in the 1960s. And they used hydraulics to make this full-body, power-augmentating exoskeleton. And it allowed you to carry hundreds of kilograms per arm and also walk in it. But due to the limited hardware at the time, it was difficult to control this interaction to always be stable. And due to its high strength, it was very dangerous for the operator. And it could seriously injure the operator. And although it doesn't look like it, it was in reality never used with the real person inside. But high power batteries and high torque motors allowed several decades later for mobile robots. And what the controllers in the Hardeman exoskeleton of the 60s tried to accomplish could now be done in computerized controllers that can actually do even many more intelligent and complex tasks. And therefore, the new generation of powered robotics exoskeletons was ready to be reborn at the start of this millennium. But then you can ask yourself, why don't we see exoskeletons all around us then, just like the cars and the airplanes? There are several reasons for that. And one of them might indeed be the relatively small target group, which leads to relatively high costs. But furthermore, designing and developing such an exoskeleton has some very unique and difficult challenges compared to designing a full humanoid robot. And there are just certain things that we don't know yet know how to get right. For example, if you look at the electromechanical design, then we would like the whole structure to be lightweight because the person inside actually takes up the most weight but you don't want it to become flexible and wobbly because of that, because that makes it too hard to control. So we add more material to the exoskeleton. This makes it bulky, and it makes, you, makes it impossible for you to sit down in your wheelchair. And the bigger the motors and batteries, and the more motors and batteries that you choose to put on your exoskeleton, the more motors and batteries that in turn you will need to move all that weight around. And this is in contrast to the fact that you actually would like to have many motors to actually give the legs the most amount of freedom, if possible. Another problem is one with control. The control effectively describes how the exoskeleton behaves, its intelligence and its usefulness. A current state of the art in exoskeleton control for most commercial and academic exoskeletons is to just play back recorded joint motion. And this kind of works well if you're also using crutches, effectively standing on four legs. Because when it's playing back these joint motions, it cannot really respond to anything unexpected. And the last problem, and maybe even the biggest, might be the one of human-machine interaction and how to get that right. How can we make sure that the user using the device, actually trusts what the exoskeleton is doing? How can we make sure that the user can communicate their own intent to the device without giving explicit commands like buttons or voice? How much should the device actually know about its environment and respond and make plans according to that? And how should the device communicate that back to the user? We actually just don't know. And humans are rather squishy, and everything can stretch your skin. And this makes it hard for the exoskeleton to properly hold on to you and to move you and apply forces onto you in exactly the way that it would like. And spinal cord injury patients, they come all in, they come in all different shapes and sizes. I mean this literally, but also in the sense in what they can and cannot do anymore. 
Some people with leg paralysis, they suffer from what we call involuntary muscle spasms. So when the exoskeleton would be walking them, they could accidentally activate their legs without knowing, and they would be opposing what the exoskeleton is trying to do. And how can we separate that from actual user intent if there's some function left? And others could be so much worse off that they cannot even balance their own upper body. And then how can we develop a single solution that can support such a wide variety of patients? Well, to investigate all these issues, we have developed our own research exoskeleton prototype. And it gives you, per leg, a lot of freedom in motion. So it gives you two in the hip, one in the knee, and one in the ankle. And a little more freedom as well for proper alignment. And the design is fully modular. So you can take only the parts that you need for your specific problem. And we can adapt it to different body sizes. So it can be used for many different people with their own specific problems. As you can see here in this picture, where my able-bodied colleague is wearing the lower part of the device. And the motors in this device can apply forces very accurately. So we can very soon start moving away from these pre-recorded joint motions and actually start looking into these more intelligent force-based control strategies. And Nick, the one I showed at the beginning, he's a test pilot in our device. And with him, we train for the Cybathlon events. And those are like the Paralympic Games, but then where pilots use their exoskeletons to walk over all different kinds of terrain. For example, in this picture, they walk on uneven terrain, or they need to go up and down stairs and slopes. They have to sit down, stand up. They have to zigzag or show that they can place their feet in any location that is required. And the pilot, together with the exoskeleton, who does these things the fastest, without intervention, they win this competition. And together with Nick, we train in our rubber robotics lab for these events so that we can learn what does and does not work well in our current design and in our control. And this competition really pushes the technology forward for us and for all the competitors. Because it shows us how we should update our current design, but also how we should rethink and update its successor so that we can hopefully literally outrun the competition in the future. So I've shown you by now that we've made a start in getting Nick and people like him out of the wheelchair to get them to stand up and walk, have conversations again face to face, and to be able to get things from that top shelf. But we're definitely not fully there yet. So, but the more that we compete, the more that we actually learn. And the more we try, the better we can make the next generation of devices. Because we envision a future where Nick can walk in his exoskeleton without the use of any crutches, where the, where the robot will be integrated into clothing and will be acting like a fully bio-inspired intelligent agent. But to be able to get there, we have to work as a multidisciplinary team of movement scientists, neuroscientists, mechanical and robotics engineers, material and fabric scientists, and of course, many end users like Nick. We're already working on flexible robots because people usually still have their own internal exoskeleton. You can do away with a large support structure and only support the movement. And such a suit is much more inconspicuous, much more lightweight, and possibly much cheaper too. So we'll be moving away from these heavy and large metal support structures in the exoskeletons. We'll be going towards these flexible exosuits that can support your balance and walking under all circumstances. And to be able to do the latter, we're letting ourselves be inspired by nature. Because we do realize how amazing humans are at walking. So, we look at artificial vision, 
you'll look at the artificial in your ear and artificial joints and get this information and put it into an artificial, artificial spine with neural circuitry mimicking reflexes and pattern generators that will drive person-specific models of muscles and tendons that apply virtual forces onto the exoskeleton, which in turn applies very real forces onto the human body. And we hope that this makes the exoskeleton feel like a natural extension to the user's legs. And we will extend this spine with an artificial brain that can learn from its own actions, can predict consequences of its own actions. And for each unique person with their unique body shape and type, with their unique leftover capabilities, it will evolve, learn specifically how to optimally support them. All of this to align the wishes of the device with those of the user. So the personalized powered exoskeleton will come in the future. But before we get there, there's just so much to still investigate, research, and to explore. And we're only just now making our first steps. Thank you. <laughs>